You are listening to the One Day at a Time podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Hello, loves. Thank you for downloading the podcast. My name is Arlena, and I'll be your host. Today, my guest is Andrea Owen, author of several books, the most recent being released at the end of August, Make Some Noise, Speak Your Mind, and Own Your Strength. She is super funny, but she's also deeply insightful and has tons of practical advice to share. You might even recall her first visit with us, episode 31. That was some time ago. I'm excited to have her back and share highlights from her new book. To hear more episodes like this one or have them delivered right to your inbox, you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter. Just visit odatchat.com. But before we jump into the episode, I'm excited to announce that I'm now accepting clients for hypnotherapy. If you're struggling with unhealthy cravings, self-sabotage, internal resistance, or self-confidence that is holding you back, I encourage you to set up a free strategy call with me to see if hypnotherapy is right for you. Just visit SoberLifeSchool.com. So there you have it. Please enjoy this conversation with Andrea. Andrea, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, I'm so glad to be here again. Yes, so we were just chit-chatting. I cannot believe you were episode 31. We're almost at 160. I was an early adopter. I'm honored to be back. <laughs> Now that you're such a seasoned podcaster, it's been five years. It's been since I did this podcast. I actually even had one before this one, but um, yeah, I was I was like, okay, so you uh, Andrea was episode thirty one. So if they want to hear like your, we talked about your last book. It was the uh, How to Stop Feeling Like Shit: Fourteen Habits That Are Holding You Back from Happiness. Yes, it's been three years. And then I also told, I told, I think my longer recovery story, my sobriety story in that episode. Yeah. So we'll kind of give the, the highlights, but um, that, that was a great episode. And I'm super excited to talk about this book called Make Some Noise, Speak Your Mind and Own Your Strength. That's such a great title. How did you come up with that? Thank you. It was originally a different title and it had a curse word in it. And my publisher was like, <laughs> not again. Um. <laughs> It really you makes marketing options. Yeah. Makes marketing a challenge, right? Mar- and no. And I and I agreed with them. And I wasn't totally married to the original title. So I just we made a list and brainstormed and that was on the list and it made the most sense. So that's how it came to me. <laughs> it's, that's so funny. I have a friend who wrote a book called that had the F word in it and it was about how to survive the first three months of Gre- like when you're grieving mm. and she like, it's impossible to market if you have the F word in the title. <laughs> right. You're considered a liability for media if, if yeah. Yeah. Mm. So good move. Good move on that one. So we were, we were just identifying three things that they're going to be able to walk away with today, which is how to find your voice. So important for women. Mm-hmm. We're taught to be quiet and be nice and don't be too loud. So I'm excited about that. And then how to harness your true desires. And we're going to talk about how to avoid numbing out. It's honestly yeah. a, still a thing for me. This is numbing. Same. One. <laughs> I mean, addict. <laughs> how do you feel about Netflix? That's not numbing out, is it? <laughs> mm, yeah, I know. For some, it is. Netflix isn't really my thing. I drive my husband crazy because I only want to watch one episode of a show at a time. <laughs> I, I like to ration my shows. And he's constantly like, no, let's watch another episode. You know, it's Handmaid's Tale or whatever. Something suspenseful. Oh and I'm like, no. I don't know. It's it's. Just, I think it depends on the person. It depends on the person. I'm definitely in the binge category, so that would <laughs> <laughs> we we could not watch shows together. <laughs> it's so oh funny, gosh. Um, but good for you because yeah, TV it can be such a way to numb out. So I'm I'm wrestling mm-hmm. with that one. Um, before we dive into, I cannot wait to talk about this book. Um, but I thought we would sort of do the lightning round, which is a series of fun little questions that I know you're going to do great with. So the first one is what was your favorite recovery book when you first got sober? Oh gosh. 
Uh, you know what? I always go back to Codependent No More. By oh, Melody really? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just, I come from a long history of codependence, <laughs> codependence, you know, like people and then codependence, the, the, act, the action. So it's, it's one that I continuously go back to. Melanie Beatty, she's not, she had, mm-hmm. I used to read her, um, the, like the daily, daily reflections type of thing, like a daily, she had a daily reader. So good. Yeah. I read that one for a year. The other one, if I could tack on one more and oh, it's, yeah. because it's, some, it's, directly related and it's Pia Melody's facing love addiction, which was the, well, yeah, that was probably the first book where I read it and and thought to myself, she's writing about my life. How does she know so much about my life? And I was just relieved to know that it was a thing and that I wasn't just crazy. You know, I don't think love addiction actually gets enough attention because it's yet another way for us to avoid our own feelings and use other, like we're using other people to change the way we feel. And love totally. addiction can be just as devastating and deadly as any others because it still leads to that dark place of I'm broken. This is never going to change. Yeah, the shame around that. Well, and it's funny when you said that you love to binge on Netflix, my thought, my internal thought was it was never food or TV and movies for me, it was always, it was men was my number one Mm. men in relationships. And like that rush of a new relationship and being obsessed with someone and getting them obsessed with me. It was, it was dark and a vicious cycle that I struggled a lot with in my twenties. In your twenties. You know what? I don't know if you had the same experience, but when I, once I found, you know, my husband, um, that switch, it was difficult to turn that off. Like totally. just, be, just because I found the love of my life didn't mean that like that instinct to hunt per se, it mm-hmm. didn't get switched off. Was, did to you have chase. that experience? Yeah, to chase. 100%. Like I had to talk to my therapist specifically because I found myself sabotaging this like first normal man that I was with. I'm like, this is really boring. And, and she's like, <laughs> healthy relationships are pretty boring, Andrea. Like you're so used to chaos and drama. Uh, you're trying to create it. The other thing was that just a quick anecdote. Um, when my dad died in 2016, I had an ex-boyfriend reach out via Facebook Messenger just to express his condolences about my dad, you know, because he had met him. And I found myself wanting to keep the conversation going in Messenger. And I've, I was, you know, like 30 days out of losing my father. So it was deep in my grief. But I realized very quickly that I was using just that back and forth message to you know, to try to heal my wounds and like for that relief that we get from drinking. And I was so grateful that I figured it out very quickly and saw what was happening and um, was able to shut down the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally get that. Um, You know, those of us who just love people, it's easy to, it's easy to go out of balance and it doesn't mean that you have to do something as far as betrayal or anything like that, but it's very easy to slip into um, allowing a conversation to go on too long. Right. And and it was for me, like I was using people, like I, I hate to admit it, but that's the truth. I'm incredibly ashamed of the behavior, but I was in so much pain as many of us are. I was using people to to validate myself, to have them try to heal my broken heart. Yeah. That's always like the looking for something external to fix something on the inside. Yeah. And there is so much shame around that. It's embarrassing to even talk about, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's normal and it's human. And, you know, just the, I, just the um, recognition that you had so early to catch it is a huge side. I can always tell when someone has done their own work. Right. Like we you always obviously... know. Yeah. Well, we always know when we're using, I think, or trying to use. <laughs> I think some people are just so disassociated that they don't, yeah. they don't recognize it until there's like a, a heavy handed consequence. But, you know, um, that's a, that's a very sure sign of recovery is when you can catch it quick. That's a sign that, yeah. oh, okay, I'm doing it my is. work. <laughs> it's that feeling in your stomach and you're like, dang it. Oh, here I am again. Yeah. It's like, oh shit, distracting Mm -hmm. from the pain. Right. And so we don't deserve judgment for that. We deserve compassion. It's the empathy that heals the shame. Yeah. Um, Thanks for addressing that. Okay. So facing love addiction. I'm sorry, who wrote that? Pia Melody, Ah. founder of the Meadows. 
Melody. Okay, I will put links to those in the show notes. Okay, do you have a favorite uh, mantra that you live by or quote or is there something that's sort of up in your world right now? I always, the first one that came to me is what I say to myself. If I find that I'm beating myself up, which still happens once in a while, is I tell myself, well, that just happened. And then I move on. It's just acknowledging that it's there instead of trying to bully the bully or say a positive affirmation that I'm not going to believe anyway. <laughs> so, mm. Yeah. Well, that just happened. That, so what just happened, the behavior or the beating yourself up part? The beating myself up. You, you, you know, you notice it and you go, oh, well, look at there. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> inner critic. That's interesting. That's interesting. And then walk away. So I, I, I acknowledge it because if I ignore it, it keeps persisting. <laughs> I resist, persists. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it sounds kind. It's, I, actually, it sounded very neutral. Oh, exactly. It, that happened. Exactly. It's not positively or negatively charged. It's completely neutral. And I just, I try to walk into it without, a whole, like without meaning. It doesn't have to mean anything. Oh, isn't that the truth? It's like, it's so funny how we assign meaning to things, right? It's We create these little stories in our minds. Mm-hmm. But I love, I love that. Well, that just happened. Totally mm-hmm. neutral. It's Let's casual. acknowledge, move on. <laughs> yes, yeah. Very casual. Super good. Do you have a regular self-care practice that you, that you do in the morning? Um, probably not regular that looks elaborate, but I get up early enough that, so I'm a, I'm not a morning person, but I am one. My Cicadian rhythm is definitely like I could stay up till one in the morning and, you know, sleep until nine and be very happy, but I have two children and <laughs> they don't allow it little. Yeah. So I get up at six 30 now and I don't work out until eight in the morning and I work out mo- most mornings, but I just sit and read the New York times and check my email and talk to my husband and have coffee. And it's just, I allow myself to have a slow morning also somebody like me, I have anxiety and, and I run very high. So it helps me to sort of ease into the day instead of hitting the ground running. I admire people that can roll out of bed and like go for a four mile run. I have never been that person, nor do I want to. Like, I'm just like, I'm cool. Just going slow. Yeah. Bless their hearts. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I will cheer you on <laughs> from the couch, <laughs> from my chair. I just told my neighbor, I go, I don't, I don't run unless someone's chasing me. And since, <laughs> since I don't leave my house, there's very- I'm a retired runner. I used to love it, but my legs hurt too much. I think it's hormones that are changing and yeah. I don't know what's going on, but, um, yeah, I have a Peloton bike and I ride the bike and <gasps> lift weights. That's right. Amazing. I saw that. Do, have you ever tried soul cycle? No, but everyone told me I live out in rural North Carolina. There's no ah. soul cycle out here. So um I don't even know no, soul but cycle survive. Amazing it is. Yeah, it's really no Peloton is amazing. I uh don't have a Peloton bike, but I got the app and so I can still do it. Okay. Yeah, and that's fun. I moved to Idaho. Obviously there's no soul cycle in Idaho, but <laughs> um yeah, that was a magical time. I used to go to the, the Stanford Mall in California. Mm-hmm. And that was like, mm-hmm. we're the best of the best. Like the in, super intense women would go. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah. Okay, so self-care practice. So you're reading, you're allowing yourself a, uh, a slow morning. Do you have a, a spiritual practice? I love to go outside. So we are on an acre out in the country. And we specifically bought this land because it was so beautiful. There's tons of trees in our front yard, which are sometimes very scary when there's a storm. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. Come down. I know. Yeah. It's expensive to have a service to come out to cut trees down, by the way. It's thousands and thousands of dollars. At any rate, I know this is a lightning round. Um, I'd love to go outside with no shoes on, weather permitting, and put my feet in the grass with my dog and just go out there and breathe, especially when there's a breeze and I just remember who I am. And that's pretty much it. I do meditate sometimes, but not regularly. I love that. Remember who I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I absolutely connect to myself better in nature. 
I, I totally get that. I feel, and yeah. I, sometimes I'm like, why do I feel so inspired by nature? I just do. I don't know what it and is. It's, it's part of being human. That, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's any accident that placentas look like a tree. <laughs> we are nature. <laughs> do they we look are. like a tree? <laughs> I don't think I've ever really seen one. <laughs> kind of amazing. Like I'm, I was a birth junkie for a while. Like I just, I think just conception and all of it is so incredibly amazing. I have a degree in exercise physiology, so I'm fascinated Ah, by how the human body works. Yeah, It's never ending. Amazing to me. We are the most incredible machines. Anyway, birth is no exception. My, my cousin is a nurse and she's like, the human body grows a disposable organ. And I was like, what? Oh my God. I never thought about it that way. Is that the appendix? The placenta. Oh, the placenta. Okay, yeah, yeah a disposable. A disposable. <laughs> I was like, right. okay, number one, it's an organ. Okay, whatever. I don't know. It's That's amazing. not important. <laughs> <laughs> That's another conversation for another time. That's a whole other conversation. Um, let's see what else did I have for you. Oh, uh, what's one thing you wish you knew when you first got sober? Oh my gosh, no one's ever asked me that before. Um, that the pink cloud's going to wear off and it is, this is going to be a deep dive into your emotions, but you're going to live through it and be stronger for it. Ooh, deep dive. I was not prepared for that. I think I thought I was just going to stop drinking. (laughs) It's so confusing. (laughs) Wasn't that good enough? (laughs) I know. What? You want me to do what? (laughs) Pink cloud will wear off. It does. It did. Mine came back. Mine comes and goes. <laughs> just like and mine came back very slowly and more subtly. Yeah. More subtly. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. fair, right? Yeah. You really kind of have to look for it and if not actively create it. <laughs> right. That's yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Okay, deep dive into emotions. That's kind of been my tagline lately. It's get sober, stay sober, go deeper. That's go. great. Go, I love that. That that deeper. very well explains what recovery looks like in a small nutshell. Yeah, go deeper. Um, and what do you do for fun? We like to have fun, right? You I like to have fun. Plants. I do have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all your stuff is so fun, like the covers of your books. And I don't know who your photographer is, if they direct you or that's, I have a feeling it's you, but everything is so fun. Like the confetti on the front. Mm-hmm. Those, oh my gosh. Part of it is just natural. My personality is yeah. a lot like my mom's and she definitely is the same. Um, so yeah, for fun, I have, um, I have so many house plans, so that's fun. And I also, my husband and I are going to start archery, which I've wanted <gasps> to do for a really long time. Ooh. My tennis. You, and Pel- is Peloton fun for you? Peloton is really fun for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's <laughs> well. like, oh my God. But yeah, it's it's fun. And the instructors are, are super funny too. Some of them are. So that's that's a lot of fun. Yeah. And plus you like to laugh. So there's that. I do. I love the idea of the house plants. My husband calls them contestants. And it's a life <laughs> it's a life or death. It's a life or death game in my house. Hunger games. <laughs> He's like, oh, Survivor. are you a free- <laughs> Survivor? <laughs> who's going to yes. get voted off this week? Yeah, who's going to survive? It's the spider plant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've actually had him for a long time before they got super trendy. And um, At the one behind not, you is gorgeous. Is that real? This one is fake, actually. Oh. That's <laughs> It's my only fake one in the room okay. because my window's on the opposite side and ah. I cannot get anything to grow over here. This is a big room. So I have a bunch of them over there by the window. And one of my friends asked me, she's like, how do you, how do you grow so many? Like, how do you keep all these alive? And I said, you, you really just have to give a shit. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> because I used to Pay say that attention. I had a black thumb and, but I wasn't really trying to keep them alive. Like I was not looking up how often I had to water it. Is this the right soil? Like, you, it's like anything. Like, do you want your recovery to go well? You have to care about it. You have has to, to care. Be a priority. It has to be a priority. And so, having houseplants is like anything else. And she was like, the woman I was talking to, she's like, oh, that makes sense because I haven't really given a shit. I like the idea of having <laughs> houseplants. And I'm like, that's how I feel about having chickens. Like, I like the idea of it, but I, 
at the end of the day, I don't want to make it a priority. So we don't have chickens. Can I just tell you, I loved my, ch- I had chickens and I loved the chickens. I got the fancy kind because Martha Stewart um, had, did this series. like the poofy ones? Yeah. The, I got the silky chickens and the Polish ones that have the funny top hats. I got the frizzle ones. I mean, they were something, they were a sight to behold, but I, they literally, like when this, when it gets dark, they just go home. It was, it's easy. They were easier than cats. <laughs> And they're hilarious. I always felt guilty barbecuing chicken in front of them, but that's another story. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it's a thing. Okay, well, listen. Um, why don't do? Let's do a little recap of your recovery journey. And I'm always so curious about the moment where you were like, "I have to stop drinking." Like, what was behind that? And and what did you? How did you decide to get sober? Like, what tools did you use? Okay. I'll give the highlight version. So, and I had a few of those moments. So that's as I mentioned, few, I was, that's a, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I was like, that's a very important part that we have a few of those. You don't, we yeah. don't always have just one. So, uh, go ahead. I think some people have several based on one addiction, whether it's chemical or process addiction. And, uh, I had, <laughs> I had several for different addictions that I had. So I was codependent, started in my teens, all through my 20s, and was also a love addict. And so for the record, PM Melody says all love addicts are codependent, but not all codependents are love addicts. So just an, an interesting note there. I also flirted in and out of my 20s with an eating disorder, but it was circumstantial depending on how stressful my life was at the time. And so uh, my life fell apart. In 2006, my husband had an affair with our neighbor, got her pregnant um, right when we were talking about conceiving our first child. And I started dating someone else who was an addict who lied about having cancer. It was a big, giant mess. And I forgot about that's that when part. I found myself like, <laughs> what's that? I forgot about that part, the, the yeah. guy that lied about it, the cancer. It was a poignant life moment. And, and it was at that point I decided, okay, something's got to give. So that's when I started. That was my first entry into 12-step programs with Codependence Anonymous. I went to some sex and love addiction, um, but I actually found CODA more helpful. Okay. So that was, it was like, you know, on the ground in the fetal position moment of I have to get help because also for the first time I was taking responsibility because for so long I had blamed everybody else, which is what codependents like to do. <laughs> we like to be Don't the victim. <laughs> I, yeah, that's true. It's probably like part of the human experience, but I, I love to point the finger. It felt powerful to me. So finally I was like, okay, I need to take some responsibility for this. And it's not to self-blame unnecessarily. It was just to have some freedom and power because I had accepted what I was going through and I had tolerated it. I had ignored my intuition. So I started to get help for that. And that's when my drinking picked up. Um, I got remarried, had two kids and my dad had gotten sober when I was 18. So I knew about, you know, 12 step programs and, and what a high functioning alcoholic was. So much to my disappointment, I felt my instincts were telling me this isn't good. You know, it's it's not okay to drink a whole bottle of wine by yourself every night to you know, all these things I was doing. You know, we hear these quiet whispers and I, 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 I was, had the gut feeling, did a little bit of research like we did, but didn't want to admit it. Cause I felt like drinking was my last thing. Drinking was like, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't use food as a crutch. Um, I just, I, you know, I'd gotten married and I was in a good relationship and I couldn't, I couldn't use men anymore. (laughs) Just, I was pissed. I was really pissed, but I knew where I was headed and I had just started my business and I had these two babies and I I knew it was for the greater good. And so that was probably my two biggest moments that I had where I needed to, to get help. And then COVID happened and I kind of started over again. So I can talk about that if you want. Oh yeah. I mean, so many people have been suffering because of COVID. I mean, it's, you know, they say that alcoholism is disease of isolation, right? And, and connection is secure. And it's been very difficult for a lot of people to connect, um, during this time. So I would love to hear more about that. Um, thank you for sharing that by the way. Um, because we got, we, that was like, my husband cheated. I had got remarried. <laughs> I jumped over a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things there. That's okay. Yeah. That's, that's the way it goes. Um, 
And I thought it was so interesting that you talked about ignoring your intuition, Mm -hmm. right? And I feel that ties in very well with the book about finding your voice because we, first for me, it sort of starts with the internal voice, you know, whether we listen, we are connected with our feelings and whether we're paying attention to that inner voice. So tell me a little bit about why you decided to write this particular book about making noise and you know, speak your mind and own your strength. Because I feel like Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times we um, don't listen to our intuition. We're seeking outside validation. So the internal dialogue becomes totally mute. So I would love to hear about what inspired the book. What inspired the book, like to be totally transparent with you is I was mad. I was so mad (laughs) coming out of the Me Too movement um, and, you know, seeing so many things and going through my own awakening before that, but really start digging in and researching. I'm probably, I'm obsessed with getting to the root of the problem. Like, I just feel like there's no more efficient way than, than to do that. So I started looking into women's empowerment and feminism more specifically, like what is white feminism? You know, we're having so much civil unrest and noticing that, a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm speaking primarily t- to women here. So t- give me just a minute. That, that our, um, our negative self-talk, people-pleasing, perfectionism, um, it, you know, we talk about internalized misogyny. Like these are the, the pro- like imposter complex. These are the behaviors that we do. And what, where is that from? Where did we learn that? Because we're not born this way. Where did, where did these coping mechanisms, if you will, stem from? And in my big fat opinion, it stems from growing up in a patriarchal culture that that teaches us this. And this isn't to blame anyone. This isn't to blame men. This isn't to blame any, one of any gender. It's just, this was the Kool-Aid that was offered to us and we drank it because there was no other beverage offered. So it's really about us just getting curious about it and noticing, challenging the question so that we can learn new ways of behaving and thinking and believing. That is a lot to unpack there. Uh, You, I wrote down a couple of things that you mentioned that were, that come up in my world all the time, you know, people pleasing and imposter syndrome. What does people pleasing mean to you? Well, there's, there's kind of two different versions of it. There's people pleasing. And that's when you are saying yes to things that you don't want to do. Um, it is kind of running around like crazy hustling as Brene Brown says, hustling for your, for your worth. So approval seeking is a little bit different because not all approval seekers are people pleasers. Like these people may be okay with saying no and like feeling good about that, but they are still seeking out the approval of people that don't really matter. Um, you know, this isn't about, you know, I wrote a chapter in my last book called, um, I can't remember what the exact name of the chapter was, but it's like the zero fucks mentality. Like that was kind of a, a thing, <laughs> yeah. you know, like a, like a rally cry, which I love the sentiment, but it's not black or white. You know, we don't people please to the cows come home or give zero Fs about what anyone thinks of us. Like there's a middle ground. So it's about finding that. So I just wanted to, to make that distinction of like what it looked like. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, saying, Saying yes when you really mean no, for me, is kind of at the core of the people-pleasing, you know, seeking validation instead of being able to give it to myself. For a long time, it just didn't feel satisfying to give myself that um, that uh, validation, like I needed it to come from other people. Did you have that experience as well? How did you change that? Yeah, 100%. Like, I'll let you know when I get there because I'm still <laughs> working on it. Well, it's just we learn at such an early, you know, my daughter's 11. So it's been really interesting. And I have a son who's 13. It's been interesting to watch them. And, you know, I'm a little bit like Jane Goodall, you know, like in the corner with my clipboard, watching them grow up in this culture with a mother who, who talks to them about feminist issues. But at the same time, like I'm not in charge of what they see on the media, like watching on YouTube sometimes or from their friends at school, like out in the world. And we learn, now, of course, I'm, I'm speaking generally here. There are always exceptions. But for the most part, we as women learn from a very young age to be accommodating. Yes. Like that is nice. valued in us. 
we are to be nurturing and nice because there's a difference between nice and kind definitely make everyone else comfortable especially men and to put everyone's wants and needs before our own that is considered what a good woman is and there's punishment and reward based on that like we are rewarded the more we are like that so that often means not standing up for yourself that often means letting your boundaries be crossed saying yes when you don't want to all for the approval of others and to be in the closest proximity to the people at the top. And we don't realize this. Like the book was born from me being a 40 something year old woman and saying like, I've had enough. <laughs> I am exhausted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm exhausted. And I want something different for my daughter and all the other young women coming up. Well, there it is, right? It's like, we want our lives to mean something. We want you know, when we finally have the courage to say no more, or I'm sick of this, it's like, not only am I sick of this is I don't want the women coming up behind me to have to endure for as long as I did. Like we want them to yeah. be able to say no sooner. Right. Right. Um, well, I want to answer your question. Cause you asked and I was, I was only half joking when I said like, I'll let you know when I get there. Like I, I definitely have taken some steps and I'll on a personal note, um, a couple of years ago, I decided that I was going to stop taking on all of the tasks in our household. And, you know, my, my husband was starting to notice and he got upset and, <laughs> you know, basically to the effect of like, I feel like you just don't care anymore. And oh. I was like, on one hand, furious. <laughs> and then on the other hand, like, oh, you feel like you're being left out and like in some senses like oppressed because I'm not doing everything for you anymore. So I had to, um, because I care so much about this relationship, I had to be very honest and forthright with him. And at the same time, take responsibility that I had taken everything on and he had never explicitly asked me to. Right. Yes. He and I grew up with traditional gender roles, which we've had some very candid conversations about, but I had to be really honest and say, this just sort of happened in our marriage because we both expected it to. Right. And I don't think this is fair anymore. Like, do you? And he's like, mm, actually, no. You know, it didn't mean that he was like super excited to start taking things on. <laughs> we did. And it's been deeply uncomfortable conversations. Um, me being terrified to say some things because I'm afraid of being abandoned. I'm afraid of being rejected. I'm afraid of being dismissed. You know, it comes down to a lot of times just feeling dehumanized. And I'm not saying my husband does this, but like in the broad spectrum of possibilities, that's what I'm afraid of. Yeah. I mean, we all have these deep subconscious beliefs, right? And we're, I think most of the time we're not even actually aware of them. And so no. that's, you said something really interesting. You, you talked about uncomfortable conversations and I've heard it said that the quality of our lives depend on our ability to submit to uncomfortable conversations. Right. And so, <laughs> right. It's like, we have to be able to, you know, find our voice and that is a perfect example of a place where we can find our voice. Um, so, and that was actually one of the three things I was hoping that we could deliver on. How did you find your voice? Well, I've always, <clears throat> excuse me, I've always naturally just been loud in terms of volume. <laughs> and outspoken, yeah. But I, I learned that that's not, that's not finding your voice. Um, it really isn't. And you know what, to be perfectly honest with you, one of the things that was so incredibly helpful for me, and it, I got sober through 12 step program. It was, it was very influential in the first few years of my sobriety and recovery and step four in really sitting down and looking at all the resentments I had, <laughs> realizing how many I had so that many. was carrying around yes. and seeing which one of those was it really about me? Which one? Of, which ones of those was really a boundary conflict? Um, you know where I needed to make amends, and and specifically the ones of where I needed to have a hard conversation and either tell someone that they had crossed a boundary with me. You know, depending on how invested you are in the relationship and things like that. Lots of nuances, but to bottom line it, that was one of the ways that I found my voice, and and also. 
the other really important aspect of this is learning how to have hard conversations. Because I had thought for so long that that's what confrontation was, that we got in somebody's face, we yielded an ultimatum and are wielded, I, I should say. Like, that's not how that works. Like, no, it doesn't no, work. That's, no, it's terrible. Like, no one wants to listen to you when you have backed someone into a corner. And even John Gottman's work tells us that once heart rates get to a certain elevated level, the part of our brain that listens and comprehends and understands language shuts down. So, you know, I, I learn so much from my best friend, Amy Smith. She's a communications expert. Ooh. And she like kind of has this formula about like how to have hard conversations. And it's not that they're more comfortable, but it's it's nice to come to the conversation and come to the talk from a place of love right. and a place of courage and and caring about the relationship more than anything else. So this is a very interesting point that you mentioned that you mentioned like how much you care about somebody sometimes makes it harder to like, if somebody has crossed a boundary with you and I sort of translate that to when someone hurts my feelings and I have to address it with them to let them know, like sometimes if the moment has passed, I feel like, Oh, I should have said this or I should have said that. But then Mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it was pointed out to me early in recovery that just because the moment has passed doesn't mean that you can't readdress it later. Right. Like say something like, you know, I thought about our conversation the other day and I had some feelings that I'd like to share with you. Like that was a, I like just needed the words. Like, do you have a way, do you, do you have words that you typically do you have like a go-to phrase or to start a conversation? Like, Oh, what came up for me when, or I wanted to share with you how I felt, you know, do you have like mm-hmm. sort of a way that you like to address conversations like that? Yeah. Your examples are perfect. You know, and, and any therapist will tell you to like use I statements instead of you, because you're talking about, you know, for anyone who's confused by that, it's like, you're, you're, ta- you're talking about your perspective and your experience instead of putting it on the other person and making it seem like they did something that they, they might not have done or that wasn't their intention. So I think that's important. And I always say, well, first things first is I, especially if it's a very difficult conversation, I have to prepare myself that the only thing that I'm in charge of is how I show up in the conversation. I cannot be attached to the outcome, which is so hard. So good. That's so it's good. So hard. Like and knowing that if you show up as your best self, then you win. You absolutely win. And if things go your way, that's just a bonus. So I, I might say, depending on the person that I'm talking to, I might say something like, um, this is difficult for me to say, but I found myself procrastinating on it and, and holding it in. But at the end of the day, I care about you and our relationship so much that I, I, can't, I can't not say anything. And I'm hoping you're open to hearing it. Um, yeah, I mean, I hate com- hard conversations like the next person. Like, I'm not saying that that they're easy to do. It, it I like what's on the other side, and and right. typically they're very short. They're not as long as we think that they're going to be. Yeah, it's like I needed to let you know that when you, when I heard this is what I heard, and I yeah. felt really sad about it. Like um, a friend of mine recently said, "State a hardship and ask for what you need." Like the hardship is like, wow, is this is what I heard. And that was really hard to hear. Is that what you really meant? Like, could you clarify for me? Like, I need some clarification. Like that, that was super useful. That that seems Mm -hmm. to be easier to say than, by the way, you did this. And when you said that, I felt this and Right. And you do this all the time. And like, that's not, that's not helpful at all. But I I love what you said, Arlena. And and I also use like, you know, what I'm making up over here is this. What I'm making up over here. Because we're making it up. That is, that is, oh my God, I'm so going to use that. What I'm making up in my mind, because that's actually legitimately what's happening. Absolutely. What I'm making up. (gasps) I'm writing this down. The brain science is really interesting around that too, is that our, our brains want to close the loop. Yeah. Um, Like, you know, we want a beginning, a middle and an end. And if something happens, like say you stood me up for this meeting and um, I didn't hear from you for an hour. And and I want to know, like, my brain is like, what happened? She's mad at you. 
she thinks you're an idiot. You know, and like we come to these ridiculous that that's what it that's what jumping to conclusions is. Literally. Our brain is closing the loop and actually the reward system goes off when we have a conclusion because but at the same time our brain doesn't care if the story is true or false. It just wants an ending. It wants a conclusion. We need a conclusion. Mm-hmm. That's why we jump to conclusions so much and we that's overthink why. things. So. Oh, brilliant. That is such a I, good I don't point. know if it's the brain. I don't know this part, but I assume it has something to do with like burning the least amount of calories because oh, yeah. that's what our brains want to do. It's like the shortest way to like stop burning calories. <laughs> well, the brain uses 80% of the glucose that is mm-hmm. consumed. And so your brain- Brains love carbs. Brains love carbs. Um, so our brain does need to be efficient. So that's yes. what I get. Um, that is fabulous. Okay, Um the other thing that we were going to talk about, did we already talk about n- numbing out, avoiding numbing out? We kind of No, did. we haven't. No, we haven't. Okay, Mm-mm. let's get to it. How do we okay, avoid numbing it. out? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I wrote a pretty lengthy chapter on this in my last book, and that came out in 2018. And then COVID happened. <laughs> and I take it all back. <laughs> no, I just, I think that a global pandemic, I was telling people, you know, the clients I had, I was like, you got to do what you got to do to survive. You know, like, no, I don't want people to relapse. But if you feel better watching four hours of Netflix, then by all means, if you want to have six Oreos, (laughs) by all means. Like, I do think that that sometimes the line is very blurry between self-care and numbing out. That being said, Let's talk about this from like a non-pandemic, okay. normal <laughs> circumstances. Everyday stresses, okay. right? I think that at the end of the day, we are trying to avoid the hardships of life. You know, we're we're trying to run away from our past. We're trying to run away from our feelings. We're trying to run away from hard conversations. We're trying to run away from anything. Um, I forget who it says. It might be Tony Robbins. So and he's not my favorite, but he talks about like, we're basically like after we, it's pleasure or pain, right, you know, yeah, avoiding yeah. pain or going after pleasure. And that's a very general statement, but I agree with it if we're talking about this. One thing that I didn't realize was a side effect of actually facing and processing my feelings. Cause that really happened in 2011 when I stopped drinking was that that was going to be my power. And you could not have convinced me of that <laughs> before. Right, right. I was like, no, 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 no. Watch me run away. <laughs> Watch me fast. This is power, how well I can do this. And it was through the actual feeling and digesting and processing of some pretty difficult situations and traumas and circumstances and truths that I was able to find my power. And I think part of that is realizing that it's just a part of being human. It's the thing that connects us all. And how freaking powerful is that? Nobody comes out unscathed. Nobody. Right. So you hit the nail on the head when you said feeling and digesting, right? Mm-hmm. And ha- so what? what is your process for feeling and digesting those? We talked about, your, you know, having trauma, PTSD, mm-hmm. complex trauma. Um, how did you feel and digest those seemingly overwhelming experiences? I think that, you know, one of my favorite things to say is to give people the dignity of their own process. Um. And for me, that has looked like, you know, the older I get, the more I understand what my process looks like, whether that's getting up in the morning and needing to take my time or coming across yet another personal development hurdle that I have to go over, that I have to jump over. What it looks like for me is I, um, I stay in denial sometimes for a little bit. I'm like, no, I don't want to face that. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to. And then I surrender and then I get angry. So I'm an Enneagram eight and we oh, get oh angry. God, very easy. Are you too? Yes. I just did <laughs> no it. No wonder I like you so much. I know. <laughs> so love. So eights, nines, and ones, when we're feeling out of control, we um, typically immediately go to anger. And 
So I get pissed and then I stay there for a little while and I get resentful. And then once I move through that, then I can sort of like dive in and feel the sadness and the shame and or whatever else comes with it. But that's that's my process. And journaling helps, talking to my therapist helps, laying in bed with a blanket and my dog helps. Um, talking to my husband, like just the, the the regular things. Like I don't have any magical thing that I do. You know, sometimes being on an antidepressant, I got put back on one when 2020 happened. There were other circumstances that happened where I just like I can't deal with life. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. Yeah. So I totally relate to obviously the go to is the anger because um, I don't like to feel the sadness and the shame. Like I will avoid sadness and shame at all costs. And, um, y- you know, I, Brene Brown talks about empathy being the antidote to shame. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny. Have you ever had that experience where you're just like holding your shit together and somebody that is a safe place for you goes, oh, are you okay? <laughs> oh my God. Nothing. Like, absolutely un- not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Nothing unravels me faster than a little bit of empathy when I'm like, uh, like hold, trying to hold it all together. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So feeling and digesting. So is literally feeling the feelings so that they can process and resolve. Yeah. One, another book that I really, really liked is Emily Nagoski and and her sister Amelia Nagoski wrote the book Burnout. And it's, it's for women. I, I, I loved it. And I don't read a whole lot of nonfiction. I, I embarrassingly admit, um, but I think it's chapter two where she talks about, uh, you know, again, like um, closing the cycle, finishing the cycle. It's the stress cycle. And, and I, I love, I also love any book based in science. And I know, she, talks, it. she talks about how, when we don't, face our feelings, it manifests as so many different things. You know, it can manifest as insomnia, anxiety, depression, um, you know, things like resentfulness, anger, lashing out, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to do things that close that loop. And sometimes we have to do it more than once. One of those things is exercise. And I mean, there are some moments where I'm like, I do not want to work out, but I try to work out five days a week. And I notice that my anxiety is massively less <laughs> when I work out and it's about, it's expelling the energy more than anything. It's expelling the energy. And it's really interesting. And she talks about animals out in the wild and when they're chased, you know, and, and if they don't die and it's like p- being woken up from anesthesia, like how your body trembles, like there's a physiological experience that's happening yeah. when we are under big amounts of stress and we have to do things to, finish the cycle. And a lot of humans don't, we don't. So we're walking around like a raw nerve, like waiting to just totally explode. Yeah, absolutely. Expelling energy that I've heard, it, I've heard it said that mood follows action, you know, and, mm-hmm. and moving your body, you know, the issues are in the tissues and we really yep. need to do that. That body work is necessary. And listen, for people who don't want to do Peloton or do, listen, walking outside, Till your till your body feels best exercise. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't run Before anymore either. To walk. Yes. Yeah, it hurts my running hurts my hips and stuff. But I have learned other things like even just yoga, just stretching mm-hmm. and moving my body, breathing exercises. I've been doing Wim Hof breathing. Yeah. Before that allows me to settle my body so that I could do like a ten minute. You know, have you ever heard of Tara Brock's rain meditation? I know of her, but I don't know the RAIN meditation. Oh, so RAIN stands for recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. Ooh. Magical. Yeah. It's my morning That's practice. Amazing. Yeah. To, it just helps me siphon off that, you know, nervous, uh, the, the negativity mm-hmm. process to resolution type stuff. But um, I ex- love that. Yeah. Exercise is a huge, huge thing. Um, so let's talk. One of my favorite things is to just be you know, visualization, you know, forward facing, like, how are we going to create the life that we do want? And you do talk about in your book, um, you know, true desires leading to the life you really want. How, how do we really want what we want a lot, let ourselves want what we want Mm -hmm. and, and create that life? 
Yeah, this is this can be tricky for women. And, you know, because again, going back to that conversation, we're taught not to put our wants first. Right. And, you know, women who, women who express their desires and make them known and go for them are typically Labeled. categorized as selfish and a diva. And there's all these not, not so nice names. I think that a lot of women, when you ask them that question, like, what do you want more than anything? Like, what are your desires? They have a blank stare and say, I don't know. So I ask, what do you not want? Like, tell me what you're mad at (laughs) and tell me what you want less of. Cause typically they can tell me that. Do you want less stress? Do you want less, uh, you know, having to pick up after everyone? Do you want less errands to run? Do you want, so like that, that will allow you to open, like, what's the opposite of that? Is it more relaxation? Is it more self-care? Is it more help with, with different tasks to let you know what it want? And like, at the end of the day, like those things I just mentioned, those are basic necessities for the modern human, you know, like it's not, it's not a luxury, but, um, I think also getting really clear on what your values are, like what's important about the way you live your life. You know, for me, it's in this season of my life, it's courage, responsibility, and trust. So what do I want more of? I want more vulnerable, amazing conversations with my husband, quality time with him. I want, um, I want time to dig in the dirt, you know, with my plants. And it's just, it doesn't have to necessarily be like a six week European vacation, although that would be amazing. It's just these small things. Like I want an entire afternoon to not have any appointments. I cancel all my calls so I can get in bed with my dog and cry and just snuggle her because I feel like crap today. Right. Those type of things. That's so interesting. I do a self-esteem class. And one of the things is what is it that you really want? And it's so you know, we don't often allow ourselves to want what we really want. And I love that. I'm totally going to use this question of what are you mad at? Mm -hmm. What are you mad at? And then as someone who accesses anger very easily, I think you and I can answer that. (laughs) No wonder. No wonder. I love that question. What am I mad at? Ooh, how much time do you, how much time do you have? (laughs) Right. But you might also want to ask like, what breaks your heart? Oh, what breaks your heart? Okay. That's for the feeling, Mm -hmm. the feeling friends. Right. Some people might be able to access that question a little bit easier. Yeah. I had a client that I was like, what are your resentments? And she's like, I don't have any. And I was like, what makes you sad? Oh, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get it. What's What disappoints you? Who disappoints you? Who? Yeah. Okay. What breaks your heart? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I, I'm, oh, I, I'm one of those people, like, I want to know everyone's deepest, darkest secrets, not from like, a voyeuristic <laughs> standpoint, but just, I think naturally I'm like that. I always want to ask people the question, you know, yeah. who broke your heart and what happened? Yeah. And um, I just think that I'm just fascinated by people's stories and like, what makes you human? Like, yeah. what hurt you? Like, what were you wanting that you didn't get? Right. And how can you, maybe it's the consummate coach in me, but like, I, that's a way to figure out what people really want. That that's really beautiful, actually, because it does open up and you are a safe space, right? It's like we create a safe place because we truly do want to know, because I think, um, you know, our goal is to lead people out of suffering, right? It's not right. It's, it's so unnecessary. Like, you know, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And there's just so much suffering. And so it's good. These are wonderful questions to help guide people out of the suffering, you know, validation, acknowledgement and validation of the pain is so important before you can get to, to off of it. Like you can't get off of it until you acknowledge it and process it first. So these are really beautiful questions. Yeah, and I would never ask that question of someone unless I had the time and space to, to yeah. hear it. Cause sure. those are not, those are not little questions. Those aren't little questions, but people come to you for that specifically. <laughs> um, So speaking of people coming to you specifically to be let out of (laughs) suffering, since you mentioned it, what, what are the, what are the ways people can interact with you? Obviously they're going to, they're going to have to get the book. I cannot wait to read it. It comes out in August. August 31st is its birthday. Yay. Congratulations on another amazing. There it is. For those watching on YouTube, make some noise. Mm -hmm. 
I love your books are just so fun and colorful. Um, okay, so get the book for sure so that people can start finding their voice. Um, what are some other ways people can connect with you? Yeah, well, I would love for people to, there's free bonuses that I'm really pumped about. So if they go to andreaowen.com slash noise, there are, there's a free workbook. Cause I asked over 250 questions in the book. What? <laughs> That's a lot. Over 250 questions. So I made a workbook for people to print it out. I can't remember if it's fillable or not. It should be so we can save paper, but they can work their way through the book and actually answer the questions. Um, and there's other bonuses in there too, that they can grab. And I'm on Instagram at Hey Andrea Owen. And I'm also on TikTok. I've been loving TikTok oh. lately. It's so fun. How are, how did you figure it out? Did you have to have hire, did you have to hire somebody to help you figure it out? I hired a 19 year old. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm like, Girl, oh my God, you are, you are literally young enough to be my child. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's so funny. Girl, you got to hook No, up. I did. I hired her. She's, okay. She was great. And she kind of showed me the ropes. And once you get the hang of it, yes, it's just like Instagram where there's like a whole new learning curve. Yeah. But you don't have to do all the fancy bells and whistles. Um, but you, I, I feel like it's intuitive enough where you can mostly figure it out, even if you're a Gen X or like me. And it's just, it's really fun. The, our age group actually is is growing over there. Yeah. So there's yeah. a lot of therapists that have like over yes. a million followers. Like yes. mental health is big on TikTok. Yeah. Um, Lots of recovery stuff. One of my favorite people um, on TikTok. So have you heard of Advanced Bitches? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I need to follow that. Girl, you will love her. El- Elizabeth Kupferman. Yeah, Elizabeth Kupferman has this um, Instagram. She's on TikTok and she puts all her TikToks on Instagram and she is hilarious. She's the okay. one who wrote the book that had the F word in the title, but she she's okay. like a, a grief and bereavement counselor, but she is hilarious. Okay, she I'll check is, her out. Yeah, she's, she, um, sh- she's in our age group, but um, and she looks very like... Um, nice like she would be a nice person or you know <laughs> a, nice a mom woman. like a like a mom <laughs> or something like that and then she does all these tiktoks to like gangster rap <laughs> it's so funny That's and she funny. swears which i love yeah so okay so anyway i'm sorry to digress okay so um instagram <laughs> tiktok yeah, tiktok hey yeah. andrea owen Hey, Andrea Owen. Both both are the mm. same on tiktok both are the same <gasps> Ooh, and twitter genius. although i'm not on twitter all I that hate often twitter I just don't. It's not my favorite. (laughs) I was on there a lot, like in 09, 2010. (laughs) Yeah. When my kids were really little and then, and and I just was so desperate to socialize. I didn't want to do MySpace. (laughs) Um, MySpace. Oh my God. That is so funny. But you're on Facebook too, right? I am on Facebook. Yes. And the page over there is, is Your Kick-Ass Life. Your Kick-Ass Life. I still Mm -hmm. love it. Your Kick-Ass Life with Andrea Owen. You were kicking the Facebook page. Okay, I will leave links to all the things. Thank you. In the show notes, because um, you are so much fun to talk to. And Same. I love the work that you're doing. Such practical advice. I'm a, I'm a practical girl. Just tell me what I, like, I used to. I don't know if this used to baffle you in the beginning, but they'd be like, oh, you need to do the work of recovery. Okay, what is the what work? What does that mean? Please, <laughs> <laughs> please tell me what the F to do, and I will absolutely do it. But I was just so just don't drink, right? That's what I thought. (laughs) (laughs) Such bullshit. Oh my that is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Oh my gosh. I always say like recovery and sobriety are two very different things. And I didn't know that in the beginning. Amen, sister. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, it's such a such a pleasure to see you again. I'm so glad we got a chance to hang out. And uh, I cannot wait for people to read your book when I'm gonna I'm gonna read the damn thing myself. Thank you. I'm gonna email you as soon as I get my copy. I should probably pressure you to send me a signed copy. <laughs> you can't say no. Because of podcast. COVID, the publishers being very they're very limited with the amount of books that they send out because they have Is to that like right? yeah because they have to personally send them out and ah. there's not very many people they they try to keep keep the least amount of people in the warehouse as possible. Wow, of course. So yeah. they're very yeah. limited. But well, yeah, I, I think that my team sent you the PDF version if you don't mind reading it like on your iPad or something. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope Thanks you have again. a fabulous day and we'll talk again real soon. Likewise. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. 
One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.